If you could go back in your life and change just one thing, what would it be? Because we all have regrets. That's human life. It's the learning and growing experience. I want to read a story from Genesis today that tells of one such regretful story, a moment made in a, in a short, split-second decision. Genesis 25, verse 29. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. Now Jacob and Esau were twin brothers, but they were very different. Esau was a hairy, outdoorsy man. Jacob was a smooth, indoors man, liked to help mum in the kitchen, so to speak. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. And Jacob said to him, Sell me your birthright now. Now remember the story, these boys were born as twins. There was a bit of uncertainty as to who was the firstborn in this story. And usually in antiquity, firstborn sons had the responsibility and privilege for the family name. There was a level of honour and stewardship associated with being the firstborn. So Jacob says, sell me your birthright now. And Esau said to him, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? He'd come in from the field, tired and hungry. And Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. And the scripture says, thus Esau despised his birthright. Later on, Esau came to regret that decision made on the spur of the moment when he was intensely hungry. And you and I can think of all those moments in our lives when we were somewhat less wise than we could have been. We made decisions that we now regret. All of us have that story. We're all human. You know, in times of weaknesses, in times when we've backslid, in times when we know we should have done right but we did wrong and we failure to look after the, the cup of the Spirit inside us. And I want to talk about the, the reality is that sometimes we think we're okay and something comes in from left field and throws us completely off. Apostle Paul dealt with that issue when he wrote to those in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, 10, verse 12, he says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. In other words, you think you're doing okay? Well, you never know when something comes from left field and you're weary, or tired, or angry, or hungry, or lonely, whatever it is. You know, we are the most vulnerable to the devil's handiwork and manipulation when we're confronted by human weakness. And I want to use an acronym, H-A-L-T. It stands for hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. In other words, don't make decisions when you're either hungry or lonely or angry and tired. You know what it's like when you go to a supermarket and you're hungry. You walk out with a bag full of items more than you anticipated buying because the psychosomatic impulse is to meet that hunger and you subliminally do that by purchasing extra things. We recognise that we are called to be spirit-led, spirit-compelled, spirit-controlled, um, but in reality we fall short. You know, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Jesus' final hours on this earth, he invited his closest disciples to share with him the intensity of what he was going through. And during the night they fell asleep while he was praying. And Jesus casually observes the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And what we are dealing with is spiritual warfare on different levels. And I want to use several examples from scripture that you and I can probably relate to very well. You know, we read the story of Esau. He was just so hungry that he shed his stewardship and responsibility for a cup of lentil soup and made a decision that he came to regret. Um, what about Cain? He was really angry with his brother. And God could see the anger brewing and said, Cain, sin is crouching at the door. You must overcome it. And then Cain still stews of that anger and kills his younger brother. And then in another conversation, he says to God, Am I my brother's keeper? Cain made a decision because he was angry. He had an opportunity to opt out. God engaged at that level, but he didn't. 
He allowed that anger to determine his future. And then he accuses God. He says, this, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And so the seeds of Cain continued on down through human history. I wanted to use another example. King David was at the epitome of his career. It was a season of war. And he looks out the window and he succumbs to a wrong desire when he sees an absolutely beautiful woman bathing. He was tempted. In fact, you know, the, the testing and the tempting comes through when we are the weakest. Elijah was lonely. He said to God, they've killed all the other prophets and I'm the only one left. And Elijah despaired of life. And he tried to, he struggled. And sometimes when we are tired or lonely or angry or hungry, we make decisions. You know, think about Jesus. When did the devil tempt Jesus? When he was hungry. He just fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Now, we know medical science tells us that we can live seven days without water and 40 days without food when organ failure is right imminent. Well, Jesus was at that. He had fasted for spiritual reasons. And then he was tempted by the devil. What about another story from Scripture? Samson was strong. He was a great hero in ancient Israel. And yet his weak point was a beautiful, sexy, Philistine temptress. That was his downfall. You know, what about Job in Scripture? He thought he was righteous and beyond reproach. And he had a lot of to say in his defense. And he also raised his disappointment with God. And of course, that made the devil's handiwork all the more opportune for him. These are examples of real people in real circumstances, although taken from antiquity, that you and I can relate to when you're hungry, angry, lonely or tired, when you're hard-pressed from circumstances where you don't want to be. Do you ever wish that you could rewrite your story? I do. Or don't despair, because the victory that Jesus has over sin and suffering and Satan and death is your victory and my victory. The righteousness of Christ is attributed to us in our redemption in our forgiveness and in our renewal. I want to go to Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, to take a little bit of when Jesus was tempted. Because sometimes we can sort of say, well, Jesus is the Son of God. He's the full sum of the Holy Spirit. He is the Father manifest in the flesh. What does he know about my suffering? I want to unpack that a little bit to help us understand he does know. Then Jesus was led up into the spirit, into the wilderness, to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. He was on the cusp of organ failure. Another couple days, and he would not have lived. And the tempter came to him and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And it was within Jesus' power to raise a dead to, turn, to feed 5,000 people with fish and bread. Jesus answered in verse 4, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When you think about Jesus' temptation, you also read the scripture in Hebrews 4.15, where the author here says, We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Oh, wow. Wow. So Jesus, as an intercessor on our behalf before the Heavenly Father, knows what it's like to be in weakness and to be tempted. And it says, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So the victory of Jesus over sin and death is your victory and our my victory. And many times you and I have gone through difficult circumstances We've fought fights, we've come through battles, and we've come through triumphantly. And we've gone, praise and glory, and thank you, God, for delivering me from my trouble. If you read the Psalms, you'll see where David says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my present help in time of need. He recognized that through his suffering and his aloneness and his hunger, God provided. 
I want to give a word of caution because a time to be careful, very careful, is after we have achieved certain goals and we are celebrating victories. What about the story of King David? He looked out and he saw a beautiful woman bathing. Was it just a physical battle or were there spiritual elements to that? Brothers and sisters, let me remind you that the battles that we fight are not just physical, they are spiritual in nature. For there the devil still reigns to a limited degree on this earth. Yet all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. And Jesus is coming back to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And we look forward to that time with all our heart, mind, soul and strength for the love of God to be manifest in Christ on this earth, visibly, audibly, in might and power. But today, you and I have battles to fight. And I want to talk about the three crucial elements of battle. Because believe it or not, the easiest part of the battle is the battle itself. It is, when compared to the other two critical elements. The most difficult period in any battle situation or difficulty or challenge is the moment of indecision before the conflict. You have to decide whether you stand and fight or you turn and run. But the most dangerous period secondary to that is when you've reached your goals, you've fought the fight, you've run the race, and you've, 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 you've got there. You're a victor. And then we begin to, with energy, energy levels spent, we begin to let our guard down. Because David's faithfulness and his love for God and his integrity in difficult circumstances was beyond repute until he looked out the window and saw a naked woman and she was beautiful. You know, the scripture says, then it happened the moment he looked out the window. That brief affair, brothers and sisters, changed everything. His peace had vanished, his character was stained and his family life was destroyed. In other words, don't fall prey to celebrating or the danger of celebrating past victories because we can let down, we can relax. Don't let your guard down. You know, the devil offers us fast-track solutions to what's inherently rightfully ours, but we'd never go the path that the devil offers us. Continuing in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 8 now. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Now, the devil knew that Jesus is the Son of God. He's going to be King of kings and Lord of lords. And he was offering a fast-track solution to that glory. And what did Jesus do? Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So the throne of David was, pro- was promised to the Son of Man who would sit on that throne forever. And the devil was playing with that, fast-tracking Jesus when he was absolutely hungry and weary and weakened in the flesh. That's why we have Jesus. He's a, a Jesus of victory is our victory. Jesus was extremely hungry. But you don't know what your circumstance is, H-A-L-T, hungry or angry or lonely or tired. Now, these are known in psychological circumstances. But what about the parts of your life where you have experienced hunger? It may not only be food, it'd be a physical or emotional need at its deepest level. What about anger? An unexpected little thing from left field confronts you and everything spins out of control. What about loneliness? You can be lonely by yourself, but you can be lonely in a crowd. And the the loneliness epidemic is widespread across this world. In the densest of populations, in fact, the least lonely are people who live in the country. They talk to people over the back fence and in the shopping centres. We live in a a lonely, a world of loneliness. What about tiredness? You and I have all experienced that. Tiredness in body and mind and spirit because of the challenges we have in this world. 
Well, Jesus promised a helper. He said, it's good for you that I go away because I will send the comforter, the helper. And so your body and my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the, 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 the only way that we can overcome the temptations of hunger and anger and loneliness and, and tiredness is by the Spirit. The fruits that we bear, as Galatians 5.22, as Paul eloquently tells us, are love, joy, peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and meekness and faithfulness and self-control. That's the fruits of the Holy Spirit in us just like Jesus. And you and I are given right access to the tree of life. And in our hunger, and in our being out of sorts, and in our temptation sometimes to feel, especially if you're single, or even if you're married in a difficult situation, the loneliness that can creep in, or the weariness physically and emotionally and spiritually, I want to encourage you, because there are, in coming to Christ, in coming to God, in seeking His will and purpose, you and I don't have to live by the limitations that can beset us, that can throw us, that can f- compel us to make bad decisions that we forever regret. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So you and I, in our physical disposition, will have hunger emotionally, physically, spiritually, sexually, in many different ways. And Jesus says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the word of God, mouth of God. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And so there's our answer by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What about anger? James tells us in James 1.20, the anger of man doesn't work the righteousness of God. No, we come to deep regret. We pull the triggers too quickly, so to speak. When you know that in this world you may never receive justice and that justice and judgment is God's alone. When you read John chapter 5, you see all judgment is given to Jesus. And for all the wrongs that you and I experience that could make us angry, justice is coming. We don't work the wrath of God. We don't take it into our own hands. We trust God. And then we have peace. God, you see every tear that I cry. You know how much I've been wronged. I trust you, God. I may not see justice in this life, but justice will be coming. Men will give account for every idle word they speak. What about loneliness? Loneliness in spirit. Loneliness in our lives. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. We're invited into covenant relationship. Covenant is powerful. That's why marriage between a monogamous relationship between a man and woman to the exclusion of all others for lifetime is a replication, a metaphor, a symbol of divine oneness between the Father and the Son, which the devil tried to pry into to take a shortcut to separate that divine relationship. And so Jesus says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He says, I will be with you to the end of the age. I will give you my spirit. I will take upon myself your sins and misdeeds, and I'll give you my righteousness. And you go, wow. Wow. Fear not, says the Lord, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. I know you. He says, you are mine. This is what covenant looks like. So whether we're by ourselves, married or single, it doesn't matter. We're called into communion and fellowship and covenant with none other than the one who spoke everything into existence, Jesus, and who sustains every atom throughout the whole cosmos through the word of his power. Brothers and sisters, we have very little idea sometimes what fellowship really looks like. What about tiredness? Well, we're invited to not rely on our own strength. You can't fight physical and spiritual battles with your own strength. You're already beaten before you try. But we're invited to take up the sword of the Spirit and the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the, and the, and the belt of truth 
with the shield of faith to face life's spiritual battles, as Paul so eloquently tells those in Ephesus 2,000 years ago. Isaiah 40 verse 31 makes a very powerful promise. They who wait for the Lord. In your tiredness and weariness, do you wait on the Lord? They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. What a beautiful promise. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What a beautiful promise. Of course, we have a responsibility to get a good night's sleep every night, to eat well, and to watch the diet that goes into our mind as well. But if we wait on the Lord and we look to the Lord, there's some very powerful promises. You know, whether it's hunger or anger or loneliness or tiredness, Through life's experiences, God wants us to look to him, to trust him. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and your food and your clothing and your shelter. Life's essentials will be provided for you. Only God can meet our deepest needs. Only God invites us to trust him. You know, John says, God is light. In him, there's no darkness at all. There's no hidden agenda. There's no strings attached. There's no nasty caveats. God is light. He's truth. He's righteousness. You know, but Jesus recognized that living in the flesh, the inherent dangers of spiritual warfare, right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer is a beautiful request. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That should be something that we really should be praying in some form or some way, every day of our lives. You know, if we come to God, he gives us his spirit. He gives us his strength. He gives us his counsel. You know, an angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. There is a divine narrative in existence that most people are totally blind to and ignorant of. And yet in reality, it's there. If only we'll reach out and trust. Psalm 84 verse 11 talks about the heart of God in in providing for us from his providence, according to his timing, according to his goodness. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. That's a really important lesson to learn, especially in our formative younger years. You have goals and ambitions and desires to succeed. Amen and hallelujah. Go for it. But walk with the Lord. A man's mind plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. That's the path you want to go, not the wide, broad path that leads to destruction and death. I saw a T-shirt the other day, and I wish I'd bought it. It says, The reason I'm old and wise is because God protected me when I was young and stupid. (laughs) <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that. The reason I'm old and wise is because God protected me when I was young and foolish and stupid. You know, when you get to the book of Revelation, just like Jesus, the Lord said to Cain in the garden, or in, 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 in post-Eden, he said, sin is crouching at the door, but you must overcome it. And Cain says, am I my brother's keeper in that part of the narrative? Well, in the book of Revelation, Jesus appears to John on the island of Patmos, tells him to write a letter to the seven churches in Asia Minor, where Turkey is today. And to each of those churches, Jesus says, to him who overcomes, to the person who conquers, I will grant him to be a pillar in the, in the, in the, in the temple of my God. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Jesus says to those who are conquerors in this life, by his Spirit, By his word, enormous and great, wonderful promises exist. And the transformative journey that we are on is not just a tokenistic feel-good symbol. It reflects deep inner transformation. I want to talk about that transformation because you remember your weaker moments in hunger or anger or loneliness or tired. And you think, oh, I wish I never made that decision. I was talking to a man the other day who is a lovely, godly man who loves the Lord, but he's been lonely all his life and he's been on dating apps and he found a beautiful girl on one of these apps and she's lovely. She doesn't know the Lord. She doesn't care for the Lord. And he says, well, I want to pick the lesser of two evils. 
to marry, which I know wouldn't be right, but I don't want to remain lonely all my life. And I felt his pain. You know, the challenge that we face is that we need to trust the Lord when we're on number 40 of our hunger dies. The hunger for and loneliness, God will provide. But sometimes he lets us get to the Red Sea moment when we behind us is a trained Egyptian army, mountains on both sides, and a block by the Red Sea. And let God do what he wants to do. God will. He'll surprise you. He'll surprise me, as he has done so many times. God will always provide a way of escape. He'll always provide. You know, and in our change and in our transformation from our former lives, you know, we become a completely new creation in Christ. And the old doesn't count anymore. For example, a thief. A thief doesn't stop becoming a thief when he stops stealing. He stops becoming a thief when he starts giving generously even to his own hurt, what we call sacrificial giving. If he just stops stealing, he's just a thief in retirement. What's happening in us is that we are being transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ. And this transformation is brought about in Jesus' parable. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. This is, Jesus is telling a parable that's talking about a time of judgment. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the, goat, sheep from the goats. We see what's important. The goats on one side, the sheep on the other side. This is what judgment's going to look like. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And in verse 34, the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So those on his right have a special privilege. The promises given by the Lord is now being manifest in their lives. And Jesus gives us reasons why. And this gets to the heart of our walk in Christ. What Christianity is and should look like. Matthew 25, he gives reasons for that. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. In other words, you and I in our former lives made bad mistakes based on hunger, for example. <laughs> hunger physically or emotionally or spiritually. Now, in Christ, you reach out to the hungry and you see for their needs. That's very powerful. That's a change of transformation. He says, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was lonely. I didn't fit into society. But you extended hospitality. You provided for me when I was just like, I didn't fit in socially. That's what matters to Jesus. So from your position in the past of being lonely, and now you are in Christ, you are able to transform that into the ministry of somebody else who needs help and company and welcome and a bed for the night and a place to eat. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. Most sick people that I know when I visited them in the hospital are also very tired. A man who was sick unto death. Recently, I spent some time with him in hospital and he reached out to me and his hand was very weak and he wanted to hold my hand and I held his hand. But the weakness and the tiredness of his body was giving away to death. And Jesus says, I was sick and you visited me. Then he goes on to say, I was in prison and you came to me. I was out of sorts. I was in a place I didn't want to be. I was persecuted for righteousness sake. And in the first century, it was a punishable offense to be imprisoned in a Roman jail because you spoke out against Caesar because you proclaimed Jesus as Lord. And many faithful Christians ended up in Roman prisons. What about Paul and Silas? We have many examples of Peter in prison and James in prison, John the Baptist in prison. I was in prison and you came to me. You recognize when someone's out of sorts, you can minister in their lives. So you and I, having learned from past mistakes, from our own weaknesses, now redirect the redemptive grace into the ministry of other people's lives to help them in their hunger, in their anger, in their loneliness, in their tiredness. 
Unlike Cain's sentiment, we are our brother's keeper in a very special and powerful way. Our former lives were once characterized by following the desires of the flesh, whether it's hunger or anger or loneliness or tiredness. But the lesson stands to us that Jesus Christ was tempted, remember, in every way as we are, yet without sin. We take comfort and encouragement because he's the pioneer of our salvation, the firstborn among many brethren. But Paul's reminder, remember we mentioned earlier, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Therefore let anyone who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. It's a word of warning, a word of encouragement, a word of strength to continue looking to Jesus. You know, by God's Spirit, we're enabled and equipped from our brokenness and our suffering and our misdeeds and our deep regrets in a complete transformation now to minister in the lives of others. And in that parable that Jesus said was so powerful that as you've done it to me, the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. That's very powerful, extremely encouraging. And that is a story of overcoming. Overcoming the risks associated with hunger, anger, loneliness or tiredness. We are redeemed in Christ completely transformed to live this new empowered life knowing that the God who called us has redeemed us, loves us, knows us by name and gives us every chance in the battle of life to stand on the platform of victory and we do so in Jesus Christ's name. So on behalf of the Church of God Seventh Day here in Australia, I'm your brother John Classic. God bless you all.